Thanks, John. Do keep that Matthew passage open in front of you. If it helps to know where we're going, there's an outline uh, in the order of uh, service. Let me pray for us as we come to think about this bit of God's word. Isaiah writes, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray as we were singing earlier that you would be preparing our hearts to hear from you this morning. Where our hearts are hard and stony, would you break that ground? Would you help us in our unbelief that your word might be planted and that it might rise up within us? that it might bear fruit uh, in our lives. Speak to us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Reuben and Darren and myself went to Hyde Park Barracks, um, just near Knightsbridge with an organisation called SASRA. Um, if you know UCCF, the organisation who work with students, SASRA is just like them, except... Rather than seeking to share the gospel with students, they are seeking to share the gospel with soldiers. And it was a really interesting trip. While we were there, we watched the King's Guard form up for inspection and all their finery. We uh, paid Jacob. Oh, look, there we are. We paid Jacob a visit in the forge, and we, we played dressed up as well. So here's uh, Darren, clearly living his best life in uh, Jacob's ceremonial uniform. Uh, here's me, struggling to stand up straight under the weight of uh, Jacob's helmet. Um, we also let Reuben have a go with a sword, but uh, he was so terrifying that we were sort of backing away and uh, not able to take uh, photos of that. And uh, what really struck me as uh, Jacob walked us through all the ceremonial uniform that they have is the effort that goes into maintaining the kit. Uh, Jacob told me that it takes about six hours to clean it all uh, before ceremonial duties and if you cut any corners in cleaning your kit, you get found out. Uh, so when we were watching the king's guard being inspected, it was meticulous how careful they were. Uh, every detail of their uniform, even every aspect of their horses, was under the microscope. And if one thing was not up to standard, then they'd be stood down, sent to fix it, and someone else is called up. There was an incredible amount of preparation that went on to be ready to go on duty to represent the king. And if you're going to meet the king, uh, if you're going to be involved in something like trooping of the colour, well, Jacob told us that the preparations go up another notch. Nothing is left to chance when the king is coming. And that's what we have here in Matthew 3. This morning, it's all about the preparing of the way for the coming of the king. Only Matthew's king isn't our king. He's not some temporary king over an island nation. No, the king that Matthew is, uh, sorry, that John the Baptist in Matthew 3 is preparing the way for is the king over all the nations, the king who reigns forever. And so to get people ready for this coming king, God said, uh, sent a herald. He sent John, who, as you can see from the sheet, he prepared the way for Jesus with the preaching of repentance. John prepared the way for Jesus with the preaching of repentance. Have a look at uh, Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2 with me. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom has come near. It's at hand. It's waiting in the wings, ready to burst onto the world stage because its king is coming. And as John as makes this proclamation, Matthew tells us about him. He says, verse 3, This is the one who was spoken about through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Uh, you see, in Isaiah's day, if the king was coming with his entourage, uh, you, you'd get the road ready for him. You, you'd clear the rubble. Uh, sometimes you'd even straighten out some of the corners to make it easier for his convoy to come 
past. And Matthew, he points to John and he says, look, this is what John is doing for Jesus. He's preparing the way for the coming king. And he does that by clearing his own sort of rubble from the road. The rubble John needs to clear is the people, is our lack of repentance. That's what he calls us to in verse 2, isn't it? Repent. In other words, uh, turn from your sin and turn back to God. Turn around, change the direction of your life, John says. And he does this uh, in the sort of manner of an Old Testament prophet. Uh, Verse 4, it shows us this in a slightly uh, odd way by describing his clothing. Uh, What does it say in verse 4? John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. Uh, It tells about his food, which was locust and wild honey. Now, I don't know about you, but clothes made of camel's hair tied together with a leather belt all sounds a bit uh, peculiar. And if you think that's an unusual outfit, then you'd be right. Uh, The last person we read of in the Bible wearing these clothes was uh, really easily identified. Uh, Some verses are coming up on the screen from the Old Testament book of two kings. And the king of that day asked uh, the group in front of him, what kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you this? And they replied, he had a garment of hair and had a leather belt around his waist. And then the king said, that was Elijah, the Tishbite. Hair garment, the king thinks, leather belt. Oh yeah, I know that man, that's Elijah. No one else dresses uh, like him. And Elijah, he was one of the Old Testament's uh, prophets. And in describing his clothes, uh, uh, Matthew is saying of John, he's one of them. He's coming in that line. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of prophets. I think the the most natural thing that comes to mind is that the prophets tell us what's to come in the future. I think that's what most people think. And and that is indeed a part of what they do. And in fact, we've seen that in Matthew's gospel over the past few weeks, time and time again. He said, this happened to fulfill what was said in the prophets. But actually, the main job that the Old Testament prophets had to do was to call people back to the standards and the requirements of God. Um, They're like these road signs that you see about the place. Uh, If you drive, you've probably uh, been flashed at one of them before. Uh, If you're going along faster than the the 20 mile an hour speed limit, they they light up. uh, They remind you of how fast you should be going. And they tell you what to do. Slow down. And the prophets were like these signs. They they sort of told God's people what to do when they weren't doing it. And they called them to respond. And this is what John is here to do. He's preparing the way for Jesus by reminding people, by reminding us. But actually, we all fall short of God's standards, that that's our problem, that that's what needs to be addressed if this king is going to come into our lives. And all of a sudden, six hours of polishing your uniform, as Jacob has to do, don't seem so bad. But actually, John wants us to know this, because do you know what? Without this, uh, Jesus isn't the good news um, that he is. If if, if we don't need a saviour, if we don't need Jesus to be our saviour, then actually he's he's not as good news as he could be because, well, he might be interesting for a while as a teacher. He might be entertaining for a while as a miracle worker. He might be compelling for a bit as a compassionate man. But he's the best news in the world when we realize there's a problem that we can't save ourselves from, when we realize we need 
a saviour. And John had no problem in telling people that. And I don't know if you're like me, but I I find it much easier to speak of Jesus as a great teacher, which of course he was, and a mighty miracle worker, which of course he was, and a man of incredible compassion, which of course he was. And it's easy to fear, I think, that, that speaking of the reality of judgment and the need for repentance might drive people away, people who might otherwise come to Jesus. Have a look at what happened. Have a look at verses 5 and 6 with me. Here's what happened when this quirky preacher proclaimed his unpopular message in a middle-of-nowhere place. Verse 5, people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the river Jordan. Those places in in verse 5, they're an ever-expanding region. Jerusalem, all Judea, the whole region of the Jordan. It would be like uh, people coming across uh, all of the SW15 postcode district and then from all over London and all around the M25 to hear someone here in Putney. They all gathered to John and what happened when they heard his message? They confessed their sins. They admitted all the ways in which they fell short of God's standards and they were baptised at symbolising their desire to be washed clean. John preached what we might think is an unpopular message, and what happened? People came and people responded. He didn't drive people away. He drew them in. And just as, just as John's task was to prepare the way for people to come to Jesus. Well, that is also one of the tasks we have as the church, to make a way for people to come into the kingdom of heaven. And Johnny invites us to follow in his footsteps. And he asks us, in in our evangelism, in our speaking of Jesus, as well as telling him, Uh, telling them about the the life-changing, revolutionary teaching that Jesus offers and the amazing miracles and the heart-stirring compassion. All those things are good. All those things are true of Christ. Uh, John asks us, do we also speak of our sin, their sin, and our need of a saviour? And when we're praying for our non-Christian friends and family and colleagues, So we pray that the Spirit might convict them of their sin, might show them their sin, that they might see why Jesus is such good news. Maybe you're here this morning, actually, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. Maybe you're looking in from the edge, uh, wondering what it is Christians believe. And if that's you, I, I wonder if you've ever considered John's message a message that's uh, confronting and comforting, I think, in equal measure. Uh, It's confronting because, of course, to be told that we fall short is an uncomfortable place to be. But it's wonderfully comforting because he's pointing us to Jesus Christ, pointing us to the one who can bring us back to God. And if you have come to believe that, that you're a sinner, a sinner in the need of a saviour, and Jesus is that saviour that you need. But unlike the people of John's day, you haven't been baptised. Uh, you haven't had that outward sign of the inward cleansing that Jesus brings. Well, come and talk to me. That's something we would love to do. Uh, we, won't make, we won't take you down to the river. The last time I suggested that, I got a big shake of the head. Um, but we would love uh, to baptise you as a sign of what God has done uh, in your life. Okay, John, he prepared the way for Jesus with the preaching of repentance, and wonderfully, many accepted his message. But tragically, not everyone did. 
because not everyone thought they needed to hear it. In the next bit, verses 7 to 10, we, we see that the religious leaders presumed that they were okay, but their fruitless lifestyle showed a lack of repentance. Now have a look, verse 7. But when he, when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. John has some strong medicine for these religious leaders. He calls them a brood of vipers. In other words, he says to these teachers, you're poisonous. You're a danger not just to yourselves, but to others as well. And he sarcastically calls them out. He says, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Because actually he knows they have no interest in that. He knows they have no interest in repentance. Their fruitless life proves that. And I guess it begs the question, well, why are they not interested? And we see in verse 9, it's because they are presumptuous. John continues, Do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Do you see the mistake they made? They assumed that their religious heritage meant everything was okay between them and God. But their unwillingness to recognize their sin and their need to repent of it showed that actually that wasn't the case. I don't know if they were around today. I guess they might be the person who would tick the Christian box on the census form because of their upbringing or because of their family's faith. Or maybe because they they go along to church every now and again. But actually there's no real relationship between them and Jesus. And John's warning, it's so strong, so shocking. Because presuming everything is okay between you and God is such a dangerous thing to do. Because while the coming of this king brings restoration for the repentant, it brings judgment to those who keep turning their back on him. Verse 10, the axe has been laid to the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I'm no tree surgeon, I'm no gardener, but I'm I'm told that sometimes a tree surgeon will, will cut a tree at the trunk and that doing that will encourage new life and encourage the tree to regrow. But if they cut at the roots... Well, then the tree is gone forever. That's the sort of fire these religious leaders are playing with. And so John's words to them, like they they, they call us to a bit of self-examination. And there's unhealthy self-examination where we wallow in doubts that we don't need to have, but there's also a healthy self-examination that asks the question, are we producing fruit in keeping with repentance? Uh, That is, are we living more and more in line with what God says to us in his word? And, And when we're called up by the spiritual equivalent of our speeding sign, when God puts his finger on something in our life and says, that's not right, Do we sort of slow down, so to speak? Or do we keep careering along, assuming everything will be okay? John, he asks us whether there's sin that we need to take to the cross, where we will find forgiveness and we will find restoration. And he warns us that if we don't do that, 
if dangerous fire. It's good to examine ourselves. And um, do you know what? It's good to examine our teachers as well. I guess it's good for you guys to examine me. Because if what you're hearing from your religious leaders is slippery and deadly, like the vipers of John's day, then you don't want to listen to it. Because all they will do is drag you down with them. And so here's a couple of questions you could ask to, uh, to discern if the teaching you're getting is, is healthy and life-giving rather than unhealthy and life-taking. Two questions. Uh, do my teachers make much of Jesus or much of themselves? Who's the hero in their story? And then second, are they calling me to trust Jesus or to trust myself? Who's going to make the difference in my life? If they're making much of Jesus, if they're calling you to trust in him, that is good news. That's what John is doing, isn't it? Be reassured that teachers like that are putting you on a path away from the coming wrath towards a fruitful lifestyle. What do we see? John prepared the way for Jesus with the preaching of repentance. Uh, the religious leaders presumed they were okay, but their fruitless lifestyle showed a lack of repentance. And then finally, Jesus. Jesus purifies and refines the repentant, but will judge the unrepentant. Have a look, verse 11. John's speaking again, and he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John was used powerfully by God. Flocks of people flooded to him and heard the call to repent, heard the call to be cleansed. And yet John was really clear that Jesus is so much greater than him. In first century Jewish culture, um, your, your feet, when they got dirty, they were unclean uh, ceremonially, not just physically. And so while a disciple might do all sorts of things for the rabbi, the teacher they were following, only the non-Jewish servant of the rabbi uh, would take off his sandals and carry them around because they, they sort of weren't ceremonially clean. It wasn't something uh, the Jewish disciples could do. And here's John saying of Jesus, I'm not worthy to even carry his sandals. In other words, I'm not worthy even to be his servant. Why is Jesus so much greater than John? Well, we see it in the baptism, say, offered. What does John say? I baptize you with water for repentance. In other words, I, I sort of cleanse you externally as a picture of what you need internally. But Jesus, well, he's the real Deal. He actually brings that internal spiritual cleansing. That's what his spirit does in those who turn to him. He cleanses, but more than that, he, he refines, he purifies. That's what the fire is all about at the end of verse 11. And that fire means... Uh, that if you're a, a Christian who's going through a struggle in your life at the moment, it may well be that that hardship, far from being a sign of God's absence, is actually a sign of his presence. It could be that that hardship, that fire you're experiencing, is God with you to refine you, rather than God away from you, abandoning you. Now, that's not to say that all suffering, all hardship is God refining us in this way. Sometimes, do you know what? We just suffer because we live in a fallen and a broken world. 
But God can use those things to burn the dross away from our lives. And the promises of a day in the future, when that work will be finished, uh, when Jesus will gather us home. Verse 12, uh, his, that is Jesus' winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Uh, If you're from a farming background, you won't need me to explain uh, this to you. But if you're a city boy like uh, myself, then uh, let me tell you what's going on here. Um, The farmer would gather in his harvest and he'd put the ears of wheat on the threshing floor. And then he'd get his winnowing fork in his hand and he'd throw the ears of wheat up in the air repeatedly, like you can see in the picture behind me. And, And as the farmer does that, all the, the chaff, that is the, the sort of useless casing around the wheat that's no good for anything, uh, gets blown away by the wind. But the heavy wheat falls back down to the threshing floor. And after winnowing for a while, all that's left on the threshing floor is the valuable wheat. All the worthless chaff has been blown away. And so the farmer can then gather up what's valuable, and put it safely in his barn. It's a wonderfully encouraging picture. Do you see what it's saying? It's saying that one day, Jesus' kingdom will be fully realized. All the dross, all the chaff, all the useless stuff will be blown away. The struggles of this world will be behind us. And Jesus' valuable possessions, his people, the wheat, will be gathered in to safety in the barn. Do you see how precious you are to Jesus Christ? Valuable wheat he wants to take care of. He wants to purify. He wants to keep safe. It's a wonderful encouragement to keep going in the Christian life, to to keep confessing, keeping that short account of our sins with God, to to keep repenting, turning from our sin, turning back to him, to keep bearing fruit, living lives that are pleasing to him. It will be, in fact, it is worth it. But you can't have missed uh, that final warning at the end of our passage. If we're found among the chaff, we will be burnt up. And sometimes it can be hard to tell the two apart. Uh, Just like at the start of the harvest, before the farmer's done that winnowing work, uh, the chaff and the wheat, they're all mixed in together. You can't tell what is what. And I don't know, it may be that you're here this morning among God's people. But actually, you haven't yet repented. You haven't yet turned from sin and turned back to God. You haven't come to Jesus as your saviour. And if that's you this morning, please don't miss John's warning. Because he tells us the time will come when the wheat and the chaff will be separated. And when that time comes, well, they have very different eternal destinies. Here's how John prepared the way for the coming king. He went out preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Turn from your sin, turn back to God. Come to Christ, he said. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. So as we come to the end of this part of our time together, we're going to put that into practice. We're going to pray uh, a prayer of confession based on a bit of the Bible, not here, um, but uh, Nehemiah, another one of the Old Testament Uh, writers 
Uh, the prayer's going to come up on the screen behind me, and in a moment we'll pray it together. But before that, I'm just going to give you a moment to look back uh, on the week you've had, to, to bring to mind the ways in which you need to turn from sin and turn back to God. And then we'll pray together.